My name is Gordon Campbell, and I've lived on the Eastern Shore since 2005. Bought, I bought uh, the uh, old uh, Kellum Field Airport, which is I renamed it Campbell Field Airport in 2003, which is in Weirwood, Virginia, which is just south of Nassau Otics, Virginia, and a beautiful all-grass runways uh, airport there. And I have uh, the gallery in Cape Charles called At Altitude Gallery. I named it because I'm at altitude all the time, flying around in, in the sky. So it's all aerial photo photographic images. Uh, as far as I know, it's the only air all aerial photography gallery in the world. I've not seen another one. I also have a gallery up in Onancock, uh, Virginia, at the North Street Market. And so that, that sort of covers the shore of those two locations. And, uh, but uh, we uh, produce uh, beautiful images of the Eastern Shore, all the barrier islands the seaside, the bayside, watermen, agricultural images, and, and, but all from, all from the air. My first impression of the Eastern Shore was when I uh, was, was flying north and south down the coast. I'd fly to Florida, I'd fly to the Carolina, you know, wherever I was going. And I always saw this little peninsula because heading up to New York, it sort of took you right over the Eastern Shore. And I was always curious about it. And, uh, and so then one day I decided to check this place out in 2000 and, uh, in 2001, 2002 time frame, and uh, I came down here. And so on the ground, my first impression was that it's just a, you know, I like that, that, you know, that feeling of nobody else knows about it. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I did was I came down here specifically to see the old Kellum Field Airport that was for sale in 2002. Uh, we, had, uh, we had looked at a house prior to that down south of Cape Charles, but just more for the fun of it and didn't put in any offers. But then when I saw the airport come up for sale, I, just ha I knew I had to buy it. So I, I bought that with no plan of action to move down here full time. And uh, so we, uh, uh, you know, fast forward a couple more years and we decided, uh, I said to my wife, I said, why don't we just pack everything up and give it a try, move down there. You know, I was, I was flying down here every few weeks to the airport, maintaining the airport, but we didn't have a home yet. So uh, we bought a home and then uh, uh, maybe a year after that, moved down, decided to just throw in the towel up, up north. She quit her job, I was wrapping things up in my life up there and we decided to move on down to the uh, eastern shore and uh, but it was really that airport buying that airport that was a, the you know the precursor to us moving down here and uh, so uh, we finally moved down in May 1st of 2005 packed everything up and moved on down here so flying flying to me is just a true passion I mean I you know it's the best thing I ever learning to fly I tell people all the time it was the best thing I ever did I wish I'd done it when I was 16. I didn't learn to fly till I was maybe 25. Uh, you know, I was out of college and all that. Uh, I had been a photographer for, you know, when people ask me, were you, were you a photographer first or a pilot first? I was a photographer first to a certain extent. I, I, you know, enjoyed photography in high school and college. I never really was a professional, professional photographer doing weddings or doing commercial type work. Uh, but I did, uh, out of college, I started a photo finishing business up in the New York area, and we did the old school dark rooms and processing. We had a big wholesale lab up in the New York area there where we did all the printing for photographers. But I was also a good photographer, so I'd shoot jobs every once in a while, mainly for photographers that, that I was doing commercial printing work for. They'd be in a bind and had two jobs at the same time, and they'd say, hey, call me up and say, can you cover this for me? And I'd I do, you know, it was good side money, and uh, uh, I would cover it for them and do the photography. But uh, uh, until I came down to the Eastern Shore, that's when I discovered the Barrier Islands and started flying over the Barrier Islands. And I said, "Hey, I really want to document these islands." And that's when I started bringing up a camera. So really, around 2005 was the first time I really merged the two passions together. So again, photography was always there. Uh, flying didn't start until my mid-twenties, and then when I moved down here, the two combined. Well, uh, again, it was 100% the, the islands. You know, that's what really fascinated me, and that's what I uh, started uh, cataloging back in 2005, 2006, 
was all the islands, the entire barrier island chain. So to me, the islands are, are the beauty. Now there's, you know, everything else is beautiful from the air as well, but it's still the islands. You know, when I fly, it's the majority of my flights are out over the seaside, the islands, the marsh grass. Just, I was just always enamored with the, the way the marsh grasses, the, the uh, tidal marshes, the tidal flows throughout the marshes. And uh, so it's really those islands that are just completely, I'm fascinated with them. Uh, I'm drawn to the seaside. Uh, you know, I don't want to say that I'm drawn to it more than the bayside. I love the bayside too, but the wildness of the seaside, there's just nothing like the, the it's just, it's a wild place out there. There's no development. There's, uh, you know, uh, when you, when you're the bayside, it's, the, the creeks on the bayside are fascinating as well, but there is, there are homes built up on almost all the banks of all the creeks and beautiful homes, but they're still homes, there's development. So it just doesn't have that wild feeling of the seaside. And then I also love the ocean, the big waves of the ocean where it meets these barrier islands. And that's just a, uh, so it, it's just, uh, uh, you know, I photograph both areas, but by far I the majority of my time is spent out on the seaside. And again, it's just uh, uh, that wild nature out there that I just love. So when I'm, when I'm flying, I, I love to fly low because it's fun. I don't always get the best photographs from a very low, you know, under a couple hundred feet. It's, uh, it's, so my typical altitude for flying is between probably 500 and 1,000 feet, where my perspective is the best. I'm not too high, but not too low, where I get a nice aerial perspective of the islands. When you get too low, everything, you know, becomes, you know, uh, as if you're on the ground, and too high is, is uh, takes away that, uh, uh, that aerial perspective that I'm looking for, which shows a three-dimensionality of it. You know, you're just looking straight down on it. And uh, so I'd say between 500 and 1,000 feet is where I'm, and that's always been about there. But again, I spend a lot of time flying low just because I like flying low and it's fun flying over the marsh grasses, but those don't always yield the best photography. Sometimes I gotta climb up, but oftentimes I'm shooting something and I'll start at 1,000 feet, then I'll shoot it at 800 feet, then 700 feet, then 500 feet. And so it's nice, as opposed to most photographers that are feet are planted on the ground, I have uh, that third dimension. I can go, you know, I can go side to side, but I can also go up and down, and that makes a big difference. So people are always inquisitive about how I, you know, they're like, oh, you must be very brave, how I do the photography out of the plane. And, uh, and it, 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 uh, it, it's taken a while to develop it, but now it feels completely natural to me. It's not that, I don't feel that it's all that difficult to do, but it's, it's a, the, the aircraft is a Bailey Moyes Dragonfly uh, manufactured by Pittman Aero out in, uh, Wash, uh, out in uh, Northern California. So, so I, have, uh, I, I typically carry two cameras with me with two different lenses, and the reason for that is, the one thing that is tough to do is changing lenses in the air. I mean, I am out there just in the, in the open. So uh, I, I typically carry two cameras, two lenses. I might have a third lens if I do need to change a lens, but uh, I have those both on mount. So when I'm taking off, when I'm landing, when I'm doing something where I really gotta pay attention to my flying, I have the cameras and mounts. But when I'm ready to photograph, I take them out of the mount, and handhold them. I do that, I tell people for two reasons. Number one, it minimizes the vibration. Actually, three reasons. Number one, it minimizes the vibration. Number two, it lets me get right behind the camera. That's where I feel most comfortable, is looking through the viewfinder. From a compositional perspective, uh, you know, that's how I, I'm best at composing my images, is through the viewfinder. And, uh, uh, and number three, that's very important to me, I don't like tilted horizons. And oftentimes when I'm flying, I'll be circling a subject, uh, photographing it, so I'm in a bank, and when I'm in the bank, uh, you know, I want to have that horizon level. And so I'm always holding the, the camera to, to level the horizon. So I have a little grid pattern set up in the camera. To, I can do that in post-processing too, but save myself the time and do it, you know, before I take the picture. And so I hand hold the camera, take the pictures that I need to, adjust, you look, look around, adjust the plane. It's a fairly quick process. I'm usually not behind the lens for five or so seconds, but it's not like I'm on a highway going down a lane. I can, the plane can be a little sloppy. If it's, you know, going in a bank or climbing or descending slightly, it really doesn't matter. But uh, then, you know, when I'm ready to fly again, I put the camera back in the mountain and keep on flying. 
whether or not, you know, there's debatable whether you should call it erosion or migration, but there is, I see the migration every year. I see some spot, you know, I usually look at erosion as more uh, uh, smaller areas that are eroding because they, it might be eroding in one area, but then the island is growing in another area. And I see that every year. So these islands are migrating. We've seen that more with uh, some islands. Uh, Cedar was the first island. I saw a lot of change happening to it. Uh, back in 05 through, you know, and, uh, and then, it, and it's still changing out there, but then Cobb Island has been the more recent one in the last eight years or so has been a lot of change. And maybe it's been changing all along. I mean, they have been, but, uh, and uh, some of the other islands are a little more stable, but uh, maybe they're in their own ways are changing. Uh, I have seen definite growth in forests and, and, uh, shrubs and tree height on these islands. I've, you know, when I look at earlier photos from 10 to 12 years ago, there's definitely changes in, in uh, a lot of the growth on some of the islands. Yeah, so a lot of people come to the shore and, and, and uh, uh, you know, I've had people come into my gallery and, and say, oh, they'll look at one of my photos of one of the islands and said, hey, uh, you know, we could kayak out there. And I'm like, well, no, you probably shouldn't, you know, <laughs> unless you want the Coast Guard picking you up later on. But these, these islands are all, uh, you know, uh, some of them are five to seven miles offshore. And it's, it's the, they're, you know, depending on the tide, it's, it's very difficult to navigate out there. You know, most of, the, most of the watermen that are out there, most of the boaters that are out there are people who are out there quite often and know the changes in the topography on the bottom so they don't get stuck. There's been plenty of times that I've seen boats stuck out there on, you know, behind the islands and they have to wait for a whole tide cycle to get unstuck. And uh, so this is a great way, you know, for people to come into the Barrier Island Center or come into my gallery and see these islands without physically having to go there. Now, when you physically go there, you're also on the ground level, so it's just hard to grasp what these islands really look like, you know, from, you're just a little, it's a seven or eight mile long island, and you're just standing there on one end of it, and it's sort of hard to grasp exactly what these islands look like. Uh, so this is a great vantage point to see them from above, for people to come here and see these islands. And uh, it's just, it. Uh, you know, obviously, it's it's nice that these islands are kept preserved and in their natural state and without too much human involvement. But, uh, but at the same token, it's too bad people can't enjoy them the way I can uh, by flying around them. So I, I, I have a very unique uh, aerial perspective that just nobody, you know, I feel like one in a million out there that get to see this type of view of the islands. So I print on Chromalux aluminum panels. They're, they're, uh, it's a U.S.-based product. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I was in the photo finishing business prior to moving to the eastern shore of Virginia. And so when I was in that, uh, so I know the printing end of things. And so when I was decided to open a gallery, I had to make a choice of how did I want to print these. And part of it was selfish. I wanted a product that I did not want to give people a rolled up piece of paper with the print on it. And then they would have to go and spend more money at a framer and have it framed. And I also didn't want to get into the framing business and start a whole frame shop where people had to pick out the moldings and all that to, to frame these, these, uh, these aerial images. So Chromalux is just an absolutely wonderful product. It's the, it's the longest life of any photographic product. It's the most durable of any photographic product. And it has a clarity and vibrancy that just blows you away. It's this three-dimensionality to it. People come into the gallery all the time. I'm sure they come in here and into the Barrier Island Center Museum and think that they're lit from behind because they just have this, this uh, definition that is just uh, unheard of in the photo finishing world. Uh, so I decided to print exclusively. I think I'm the only gallery that is exclusively using the Chromalux aluminum panel uh, fine art product. And uh, so I do all the printing. And as far as I know, I'm the only lab in the state of Virginia printing on these Chromalux aluminum panels. And I print all the way from the 12 by 18s all the way up through the 40 inch by 60 inch images. But it's just such a wonderful product. And, and uh, you know, I don't know if I'll ever change. It's, uh, I'm able to frame them. I'm able to give people a ready to hang product that needs uh, no further work. I mean, everything is ready to put, and that's what I wanted people to do. I make it as easy as possible for them to put it right up on their wall. I know I tell people all the time that I have a closet filled with rolled up prints that I've just never taken to the framer, uh, to a frame shop to have framed. 
and I don't know if I ever will. So all of that investment that I made in those images, it was sort of wasted because they're sitting in the back of my closet. So I did not want that to happen when people purchase one of my images. Yeah, so uh, drones versus airplanes. Uh, people ask me, people will come into my gallery, and I'm sure they come into here, and go, they, they claim, oh, these are all drone shots. Look, he uses a drone for all of this. And, and you know, it couldn't be further from the truth. So uh, drones have their purpose. Drones are, are fun. They're neat. Uh, but they're not half as much fun as flying a plane. So, again, part of it's selfish. I love flying. Flying is a passion of mine. I'm not going to do this if I had to look at a screen and a drone. It just would be boring to me. And, and uh, the drone I bought is sitting on a shelf. I, I don't think I've flown it in two years. It's just, uh, uh, just not that much fun. Uh, in addition, the quality is, I will always, I tell people, I'll always stay a step ahead in terms of quality. Drones are imp improving. You can buy big drones that can pull up pretty big cameras. But I'll always be able to have a little more versatility in the plane. I can change lenses. I can change camera bodies. I can, you know, carry up more equipment in my plane. And uh, uh, another reason is uh, from an FAA, you know, viewpoint, drones are limited to a certain height. And also, uh, uh, you know, as far as you can see them is as far as you can fly, you know, uh, line of sight. You have to keep the drone in. And uh, when I'm flying way out over these barrier islands, uh, you know, take for example, if I used a drone, I'd have to load it onto a boat, take a boat out there, f fly, try to get the shot I'm trying to get. But meanwhile, there's six other islands I could be visiting that might be presenting unique opportunities right at that time. If I'm in a plane, I'm looking around, I'm like, oh, look, there's, there's Wreck Island, looks amazing right now, Cobb Island, Hog Island, Paramore Island, Cedar Island, they, and I can hit all of these islands and, and you know, move around to where I want to be at the right time. So you know, if it's a sunset time period, I can set myself up, or a sunrise time period, I can set myself up to be right in the right spot. Uh, but, but also drones are limited to 400 feet in altitude, so you know, that just isn't high enough in a lot of my cases. And I can be below 400 feet or I can be up at 2,000 feet. And uh, so uh, distinct advantages of an airplane, uh, from a f photographic, I just I just couldn't get these images through a, the the quality of a drone right now, and uh, that is changing. Drones are getting better, but uh, you know, but and a, and a plane is a lot more fun.